Hello everyone, thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Shop Smarter, How to Effectively Map Out Your Next Mobility Project. I'm Sarah Nicastro, Editor-in-Chief of Field Technologies, and I'll be moderating today's discussion. Equipping your workforce with mobile technology can have a significant impact on your business, but there are also some complexities that can creep up and derail your success if you aren't prepared for them. Today I am joined by Darren White, President of Group Mobile, and John Graff, VP of Marketing at Explore, who are going to provide you with some valuable insight on how you can master your mobility project. We will be taking questions at the end of the presentation. Um, you can feel free to ask questions as we go along. We'll get to as many as we can during our Q&A session, and any we don't have time for, we will certainly follow up on after today's event. With that said, I'm going to turn it over to John to get us started. John? Thank you, Sarah. Uh, as Sarah mentioned, our focus today is helping you map out and implement a successful mobility solution. We're bringing together a couple of companies and individuals that have significant experience uh, dealing with mobility. Uh, Explore is a leading supplier of rugged tablet solutions, and for over 20 years, we've focused exclusively on rugged tablets and mobility that have served customers in a wide range of industries including energy, utilities, telecommunications, military, public safety, manufacturing, field service, and more. I'm very pleased to have Darren uh, join me today. And Darren, can you share a little of your background in this space? Sure, absolutely, John. Uh, thank you, and thank you for the invite, the opportunity to uh, address the attendees. Um, my name is Darren White. I'm the president of Group Mobile. Uh, I have been in the uh, rugged field mobility space for more than 20 years, um, starting in the space as a solutions integrator, uh, trans transitioning over to the OEM manufacturing side of rugged devices, and then ultimately coming back, uh, taking that information and applying um, the value knowledge there across multiple verticals, specifically geared towards um, uh, solutions for rugged mobile computing solutions. So that's a little Great. history on me, um, but uh, you know I can tell you that as we peruse the slides and we put the slides together here, it it really is a combination of of uh, years of experience between Explorer and myself and other folks that uh, really kind of get to the point of uh, what drives uh, solutions and and field mobility. Yeah, absolutely, and I think we all recognize that today the use of mobile technology is become ubiquitous uh, in our personal lives, and it's reached a point where it's become almost mandatory uh, for companies in nearly every industry. There's been numerous examples of positive uh, ROI and making workers more efficient, reducing the amount of paperwork, helping more efficient dispatch of uh, field service and tracking of incidents. Uh, Darren, maybe you could touch on what you've seen as some of the uh, best examples of uh, mobility and the benefits. Sure, I, I, I can touch on you know uh, certainly many projects over the years, whether that was in transportation, trucking, aviation, uh, public safety, uh, manufacturing, distribution, and logistics, and I, I know. Um, the intent of this call is to have more of a dialogue uh, as opposed to, to, to touch on the PowerPoints. We all have a tendency to get PowerPointed to death. But um, on, uh, on the slide that you see in front of you, I think the, the most important aspect of, of uh, working for a successful project really does have a lot to do with defining uh, the budget associated to that. And we all know that, that budget, sometimes when it's dealing with just hardware, hardware takes up a lot of, of, of the budget. Um, but hardware is really only a small portion of it when you start talking about connectivity, um, uh, other accessories, whether it's vehicle mount stocks and, and others. But that all really needs to be rolled up. And in many cases, I've seen customers start with a, uh, what they thought was a budget um, and, and put that budget around the wrong device, only to find out that the right device that really satisfied the end user um, um, environment was really a different one at a, at a higher price. So. Um, I think we all address that either from an end user perspective or even within um, uh, the supply chain to that end user, is that really that first uh, introductory meeting has to define the budget and the budget expectations 
Um, you know, certainly it is a little bit of a winding uh, road in terms of, of the process, but uh, when you start building the business case around uh, being able to define and pay for the budget, um, securing the executive sponsors, uh, one of the key pieces here really is step four, and that's, that's what's the ecosystem that makes up that solution. Um, because it's not just about uh, one particular supplier or another. It's, it really does come down to even having a chosen mobility uh, subject matter trusted advisor or partner to help kind of orchestrate all of this to, to bring a solution to the end user. Um, customers will build a project team, usually made up of end users, uh, you know, through the process of, of, of actually uh, testing devices and, and deploying to that environment. Yeah, absolutely. And so, uh, you know, as we go through today, I think uh, we'll be able to share a lot of examples and really some advice of how to go through these steps. Uh, so as you mentioned, you know, we know projects often start with a budget, but I think we've seen too many companies that almost start and end the uh, definition of the project just around the budget. So hopefully today we'll yes. be able to share some good examples um, and some tips of how to kind of walk through these steps. Uh, I think the first you know, standpoint is while you might be handed a mobility project and perhaps in some cases you're told, hey, here's your available budget, I always think it's good to make sure that uh, users step back and, and project leads step back and say, you know, really what is the compelling reason we are looking at going down this mobility journey? Um, and the slide highlights um, some different examples, but you know, it amazes me every day we see new examples of what's driving the projects. And an obvious one is just goals to reduce paper. We have an automotive manufacturer uh, in Europe that told us how the manufacturing of one automobile requires 246 pieces of paper. And they told us stories where even when they have redundant printers on a manufacturing line, if both printers uh, jam, they actually have to shut down a line. And this is one of the largest manufacturing, uh, mm -hmm. automobile manufacturing plants in the world. So, you know, a good example of just the ROI benefits of just reducing paper, enabling instant access to the information through mobility. Uh, Darren, maybe you could touch on what you've seen as some of the kind of unique, compelling reasons that have driven mobility projects. Well, I, I, absolutely. Um, and from a field level, you know, certainly the, the, the first bullet point um, really does have a lot to do with being paperless. And, um, you know, in, in today's society, um, you know, we continue to be even more paperless in everyday lives. So every company, every organization, whether it's from a, a field level all the way through their systems, uh, whether it's accounting and billing their customers, want to get more technology involved and be paperless and improve their processes uh, along the way. Um, you know, I, I, can, I can certainly reference uh, 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 an application that was near and dear to my heart uh, for many, many years, which was the electronic flight bag to replace the black bag that the pilot carried. And uh, although it was a little bit in advance, um, I think now you can see uh, devices being used uh, both in maintenance service bay, ha you know, hangar based maintenance applications where it's now signature capture. Uh, photographs are being taken from devices. Uh, you know, it, it's helping with the log accessing um, electronic da uh, data and drawings. And, you know, that, that, that certainly uh, leaks not just in terms of, of uh, you know, enterprise applications, utility and telco, but it even leaks over into if you get pulled over uh, by your local law enforcement and how they pull up your history, your background, your driver's license, write an electronic ticket, um, you know, paperless is the number one reason for, uh, you know, adopting um, field mobility. Um, along with that, though, is in, in some cases, and if, if those that know who VDC is, Venture Data Corp, uh, really the, is the magic quadrant, if you will, for rugged. Um, you know, they really predicted the adoption of, of uh, tablets um, several years ago, and although their predictions were mostly geared towards commercial grade devices, they really did show a transition from commercial grade into adoption and, and, and more of the bell curve taking off and rugged, and that's predominantly because those that adopted low cost commercial grade devices realize now that 50% failure rates on field mobility uh, with lost data, downtime, and everything else, 
that they need a device that actually can be seen outside, can be used in, a, in an environment, take a beating, the uh, environmental aspects, and, and get the ROI that they actually truly look for. So uh, our business continues to grow at a rapid rate. Uh, the industry, from a rugged growth standpoint, is growing at a rapid rate. But I would tell you, from a group mobile perspective, we find more customers now that years ago defined their budget around a commercial grade that are now going back and assessing the, the value of a different device. Um, I think the other driving yeah. factor in mobility as well really is around uh, systems and operations, whether it's web-based. I think certainly Android has started to come on. You're starting to see that even in software applications. So customers continue to try to improve their processes across key factors. Yeah, I think you touched on a lot of good points. Uh, you know, the market, I think sometimes people see there's been a lot of change uh, in the consumer uh, side and even where uh, studies will show that market has slowed off or declined, yet, as you pointed out, um, VDC and uh, Explore sees this ourselves, is that this continues to be a growth market and there's new applications, uh, new areas that can drive the ROI, whether it is removing paper, which is kind of obvious, uh, as Darren pointed out, but just uh, simply improving the efficiency and productivity uh, of your field workers. Uh, you also touched on, you know, a lot of what's driving these projects is making sure the, uh, the users understand what are the issues that are really trying to be addressed. Uh, you know, sometimes I think we see customers that might buy into mobility just for the technology's sake. And as I like to say, they have an answer in search of a question. Um, so I think, you know, it's important, like you said, is really understand the use. If you're using it outside, well, what kind of visibility uh, do you need in brightness of your display? Or if it is being yes. uh, field workers are in a hazardous environment, um, you know, how do you ensure you have the certifications um, and that this device really uh, can be used uh, in the environment that your user is going to face? So as you identify I the agree. issue, um, mm -hmm. you know, I think uh, a, another aspect, uh, and Darren, you kind of touched on it, is just uh, making sure you understand the underlying technology. Uh, I think one of the biggest things that distinguishes the uh, industry use of mobility versus consumer is the need to think about not just today, but also tomorrow. Um, you know, in the consumer side, we some of us might be used to buying a device and then 12 months or 18 months later tossing it out for the new one. Uh, but that doesn't work in industry where you need to make sure uh, you have an investment that can last many years. We see the typical deployment for us minimum being three years. Many customers will deploy rugged tablets for five, seven years. So a key part of that is, is what's the underlying technology that makes sure it can run your company's systems um, and processes. Uh, you know, a key piece of that in terms of mobility is the, the underlying processor. And I think this is an area that uh, Intel deserves a lot of kudos for, you know, how they've evolved yes. their strategy in support of processors um, for extended life. Yep. Yeah, and I think I think you've seen that um, in the value. Um, you know, if you go back 15 years, 20 years in in rugged mobility, rugged was always known as yes, it could take a beating, but it was always it was always slower. Um, you know, the technology always seemed to be a little bit behind. Um, Intel's leaps in their processors, um, and and certainly from you know the Centurion processors years ago to the new processors that they have out today do a far better job and have been integrated a, a, at a much better rate within the rugged suppliers um, so that the technology is the latest and greatest, that it, it enhances better battery management of the device. Um, you know, but I also would add on the, and those are just some of the things that we see uh, both in terms of accessing you know, the Internet of Things, but um, the Android side of the business is, is really started to um, really take hold. And, um, you know, when Android first came out, of course, there were a lot of people that looked at it purely just because of the cost savings um, between Android and, and standard Windows. And, um, you know, but there were also some things that were of concern to the market in terms of security of Android. And those things have gone away and been resolved. We've, we've seen more of a, 
uh, a leap in Android, more flat applications, better software applications, more secure environments, um, both in cloud and others that have driven the Android um, aspects of the business. So the customer really is a great time for them to look at, and I tell them all, uh, now is a great time to look at more technology uh, options, lower pricing that fits, um, you know, better budgets, um, you know, better use cases for both Windows as well as Android. And, and so certainly, uh, again, our, our businesses and are, rea are reacting and growing in the rugged space because of those advancements. Yeah, and I think, uh, you know, again, it, it, a lot of the support by the suppliers, uh, whether it's Google with Android, Microsoft with Windows, Intel with the processors, I think the, you see them responding to the drive and the needs of, industry applications versus just exclusively focusing on the consumer side. So, as you mentioned, you know, Google has made a lot of improvements with Android to uh, make it uh, the security issues, deployment issues, um, you know, uh, enterprise management issues. So, uh, it's good to sure. see. Uh, I think even on the Microsoft side, um, you know, when people think about the interactivity and the touch aspects of mobility, uh, you know, Microsoft had a first, a few hits and misses, uh, but I think you got to give them credit that they've learned and the latest versions of their operating systems have shown uh, that can be a very viable solution. Um, you know, Absolutely. Mobile. Absolutely. Hey, um, not to change subjects, I've, I've gotten pinged a couple of times about the sound um, on the, uh, the WebEx and just want to make sure that, that everybody can hear us. Yeah, I've seen uh, a couple comments, but hopefully that's the case. Um, we will keep uh, soldiering few. Uh, mm -hmm. Want to kind of okay. shift and talk yep. about um, you know the the benefits of mobility is kind of talk about the workers themselves. Um, you know, as we mentioned at the start, uh, clearly it's changing mobility is changing the way companies think about their workforce. Uh, and we know CEOs and CIOs want to empower, you know, their information workers. But I think a realization's hit that it's more than just office workers, that your information workers are all your employees, uh, whether they're in the field or in the factory. Uh, your thoughts on that, Darren? Great. Yeah, I uh, – well, there's a couple of things that I would say. Um, you know, in, in, in a lot of the historical industries and verticals like utility, telco, um, you know, those industries have, have, you know, in some cases are on their second, third, or even fourth generation of devices. And, you know, even though they were using, you know, green screen emulation applications, um, uh, you know, over to uh, the adoption of EVDO and CDMA, that, that should date me pretty good in terms of green screen and, you know, the whole pig and the python trying to get wireless connectivity. Wireless connectivity has driven a lot of that. But I, I would say from a mobile workforce, um, you know, from an informational perspective, we, we see that more now uh, even in the, the growing industries of, of field service. And that has a, that has an it has a, and, and certainly within manufacturing distribution, um, you know, continues to be growing markets for uh, different ways to do things and different ways to track inventory. Um, you know, we've all seen RFID be adopted. Um, you know, uh, when you talk mobility, it really truly is a complex solution of understanding the customer end user application. And I can't stress that enough that many people, uh, there's somewhat of a dividing line, if you will, between what IT thinks um, should be uh, implemented and what end user wants uh, to be in implemented and what their needs are. And if there's any part of this process that really, um, you know, a role for both manufacturers and suppliers, is to make sure that you get the, get those key players together, that you understand uh, not only the device but also the accessories around the device and how it's used, what the application is, uh, what things are running on the device, uh, and what the expectations of the end user are. Because if the end user doesn't get uh, the device they want and it's not anything more than just something that made their life more complicated, um, that's not the outcome that anybody wants. So we're seeing that. Um, you know, in a lot of cases, the inefficiencies of, of mobile projects being deployed is just simply because of a lack of planning and a lack of coordination interdepartmentally. And that's part of our role as suppliers is to make sure you get those key players together to make sure no gaps are found. 
Yeah, absolutely. And that kind of leads right to uh, a quote that's on this slide. And, you know, while we're not spending time reading through them, uh, I love this quote of just uh, applies to so many projects where you say there's never enough time to do it right, but yet there always seems to be enough time to do it over. And so, I yeah, that on, isn't that uh, the truth? <laughs> perfectly. So, um, you know, let me just uh, then as we talk about building and getting this project off to a, a good success, you have to take into account uh, the workers, as you just mentioned. Um, I think another key element is ensuring that you have uh, executive support. Um, you know, sometimes we've, uh, I'm sure, Darren, you've seen this, of uh, projects that uh, get initiated, uh, somebody that's excited that thinks, hey, I can make, uh, you know, our field technicians more productive uh, by doing this. Um, but yet they haven't sold it through properly to the executive side, um, and they haven't really mm -hmm. sold through the business benefits. Um, the next part of that, um, and and we touched on this earlier, is you know a great source of information is is bringing a partner in. Um, you know, often right. I think a lot of customers might think, well, we'll bring the partners in at the end when we're doing the RFQ and and we're putting it out to bids. But you know, mobility, uh, just like you said, Darren, it's a very complicated. Uh, project. I mean, there's so many aspects to it. Um, and if you think about it, some of the partners out there, whether they focus uh, exclusively on mobility or they focus on mobility in particular industries, they have that experience. They have the knowledge. They know what's gone right and what's gone wrong. And, you know, a big advice I'd, I'd give to anyone as you think about your future mobility projects is, you know, bring bring partners in early. Ask them to explain their experiences, what's worked and what's not worked. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would, I would say that. And actually, some of the, the, the recent wins um, that we've had on our side really uh, were geared based upon a background and a history of exactly that. And, you know, um, I, I even say this to some of our, our new hires in our human capital growth that we've got on our side is that there, 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 there really is not a book uh, on mobility. There's no uh, manual that I can put in front of somebody. Um, this industry and its use cases um, and its applications has been developed um, through real world experience of those projects. And so whether or not that's in an EMS application for EPCR or, you know, transmitting somebody's uh, heart monitoring information as they're you know, having a heart attack directly to the the hospital and having live streaming from the doctor into the ambulance. I mean, the the, the technology use cases continue to grow, but I, I will I will say this that the industry is full of, of very intelligent people that have been in this business a really really long time and have grown through those pains. Um, and you know, the customer at the customer level, um, you know, really our our job is to to get. Um, IT to understand, again, to get IT to understand that nobody knows and you know better than the end user of what the problems they're trying to solve. The executive sponsorship, it, it's a little different than it used to be where, you know, everybody needs to get to the C level. The C is a big player in it and always a part of the decision tree. But nowadays, the C really does look to their teams, both IT, procurement, you know, line of business to make a collaborative decision. So. Um, you know, I can I can say that you know in every case, um, you know we try to we try to make sure that we have the right attendees uh, in the meetings and and the right shareholders um, to talk about post you know previous challenges, current um, current thoughts of possible solutions, and then ultimately testing and and deployment. Um, that's that's just all so key to to being successful, both with the customer and within your business. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, uh, you know, it really is important to think of all the stakeholders in a project. Um, sometimes you can get kind of tunnel visioned of just thinking of, you know, what I'm after leading this project and who the users um, may be. But there's many other yep. stakeholders. Um, you know, often these solutions, obviously, they're going to be running your enterprise tools and processes. And, you know, mm -hmm. Another key group is the development teams and the future roadmaps yep. for those 
software. You, if you deploy a mobile solution that isn't going to have the support for your future enterprise software, obviously that's going to create a problem. So, you know, again, uh, I think as Darren, as you mentioned, bringing as many stakeholders into the conversation uh, up front is is really important. You know, I think the other thing sometimes people there can be the pressure of the budget and timeline. And they think, well, the only way I'm going to get this done is I just have to blast through it. And that can lead to not engaging mm-hmm. with other groups. Um, mm-hmm. But, yeah, I think as yeah. you mentioned, it's critical to bring in as yeah. many people as you can. You know, and I, I I can only point to to some real um, real world examples. And you know, sometimes even on the manufacturing side, um, the wrong device. You know, people get so um, consumed with um, you know moving and selling a device. And and I had a customer actually come by an event, and they were talking about a particular manufacturer, and they uh, they they said that you know oh, yeah we, we we tried that, and uh, oh it just didn't work. And so I dug into a little bit more and. Really, the first thing I told them is that they should have fired their salesperson or their partner because that product has never been successful in this environment. And, you know, after it was all said and done and the right device, you know, in a collaboration, less focus on on necessarily driving to, you know, the sales number, if you will, but, you know, truly digging into what the customer wants. Because at the end of the day, you may get one sale, but if you sell them the wrong thing, you're not going to have the customer for life. And that's ultimately what we all strive for is the happy customer that is referenceable that says, yes, you solved my problem. Yes, you brought an ROI. And yes, you brought a value benefit. And that sometimes gets lost uh, in the mix. But, you know, if we listen and we understand and we ask the right questions, the customers will drive drive us down the right path. Yeah, absolutely. And I think when, uh, you know, a company, if you're talking to a, a solution provider or partner, and all they pitch to you is one solution, you probably should have some warning bells go off. Um, you know, yeah. <laughs> most partners, many partners, um, a lot of Explore partners uh, carry multiple solutions, uh, and they have a lot of experience, and they know what products, what solutions will work in, you know, what environments and what applications. So, uh, again, it, you know, it just doesn't make sense to not engage and tap into that uh, knowledge and experience. Absolutely true. Absolutely true. And, you know, I, I would say that, you know, that it, – I'm sorry, go ahead, my fault. Oh, I was just going to mention, too, that, uh, you know, another uh, tip is for the users um, out there is, you know, to really think through as you as you look at this project – Really think through what are the things we do well today. Um, you know, often the projects are going to be driven by, hey, we got to fix this, or you know, we need more productivity out of our workers. Uh, but mm-hmm. as you go into the project, I, I think it's worth spending the time thinking about the things you do well. Uh, this also helps protect mm-hmm. against the hey, well, we've got this uh, mobile device, and it can do this, and it can do that, and next thing you know, you end up with the Swiss Army knife. You know, you're trying to, uh, you know, make the solution do way more than what drove the project uh, originally. Uh, You know, so, you know, there's a lot of processes, a lot of things your companies and customers do uh, right, uh, and capturing that can be a, a key part of being successful with this project. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I I would say that I if I've used it, I've used this a lot. Um, you know, there there's no reason to throw uh, necessarily the baby out with the bathwater. Um, you know, these these companies have invested significant dollars into back end infrastructure network. Um, software, um, and, you know, I would say that the first question I always ask in a, in a rugged uh, or in any mobile project is to, to understand every single application that runs on their device and understanding its, its history. You know, was it developed internally? Did they buy it as third party? Has it been successful? Does it give them what they want? How does it connect? And, you know, make no mistake, uh, the Internet of Things, and hosted applications is is the direction of 
many to get that cost infrastructure off of supporting those systems. So, you know, what that leads to from our side purely uh, when you start talking about devices is 4G, uh, the roadmaps for 5G. You know, pretty soon Justin Bieber will show up in a 6G t-shirt, but at the end of the day, our job is to make sure that what technology we put in or recommendations we put in today assesses both previous, historical, and then the forward thinking in terms of how they want to uh, connect those devices, protect the data, provide security around that data, and, and that, that device. And John, you touched on this earlier. You know, uh, what I would say is that <coughs> Rugged, the, 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 the bad thing about Rugged is we, we, we make such great products on the Rugged side that they have a life cycle that's, you know, six, seven years. And in a lot of cases, it's the software, the applications that actually force the device change. And so, you know, you, 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 I have one customer that have had Rugged devices in a particular application for eight years with a half a percent failure rate after eight years. I mean, that's an ROI that you can point back to as why Rugged. But now what's, what's forcing their next step is truly that the, uh, the demands of the business and the applications have changed so much that the current device and its processor can't handle it. So yes, you have to have that historical, you have to keep what you like um, and, 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 and start to, to understand what they're going to keep and then ultimately what their future goal is, um, making sure that the configuration of what you're presenting is correct. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, a tool that uh, we've put together uh, based on our experience, uh, we're going to make available to everyone uh, at the end of this, but it's a simple worksheet that just is a tool to let you go through a lot of those things that you, Darren just mentioned of, you know, prioritizing what are the must-haves you need, what would be nice to have, and then capturing what you don't need. And this covers areas, you know, the performance, the memory, the OS of your device, but also the communications and connectivity, the display requirements. Um, you know, Darren, I think he touched on a really important thing is just knowing what the uh, devices, the data input, or, you know, and third-party devices that you might have to connect to. And often, the mobile solution might change rapidly, but, you know, there's devices in some of these plants and factories that have been there for uh, decades. And yes. yeah. you know you're going to be able to interface with those devices. Mm -hmm. So this works well, great. Well, you know, you... Uh, yeah, go ahead, Darren. It, it, no, it is. It is. And I, I, you just touched on a, a point that is so, uh, um, you know, device consolidation is showing up across multiple uh, verticals now. And that's where, okay, well, I use a barcode scanner over here that's a handheld, but I now can consolidate that into a tablet that has a barcode scanner. Or, you know, I need to have power on pen 9 off of my dock um, so that I can not have to get rid of what I've invested in in external scanners, but still run that on a tablet that's you know mounted on a forklift. So, yeah, you're you're seeing that and understanding the accessory applications and how they get power, um, how that all right you know, goes into the checklist is just as vital. Um, because if you go down a path and you find out, oh well, they can't get rid of this or they can't tether that, um, that affects the ultimate end user experience. Yeah, exactly, and and you know that often can manifest itself that oh, you know, if my rugged tablet doesn't have the port or the connector I need, then you have to carry around or your user has to carry around some dongle. And I think a lot of us that yep. spend a lot of time traveling, um, I know, I think in my uh, in my case alone, I must have five different dongles to connect to you know various things. Well, imagine if your field worker is expected to do that, that's a recipe for failure. Uh, the next thing I want to touch Agreed. on, uh, you know, we've talked about building, you know, the stakeholders, the executive sponsors, engaging partners. Um, you know, clearly in this day and age, there's no shortage of information that's available out there, uh, articles, white papers, analyst reports. Um, but I think, you know, Darren, you already mentioned how important it is for uh, people to ask questions. Um, you know, what are some of the, the questions or the gotchas that you think can um, kind of uh, stumble some projects, you know, whether it's uh, misinterpretation of a spec um, or something else?
So, you know, I know, for example, we've seen uh, cases where uh, a possible solution will be spec to have high temperature rating, uh, but yet, you know, what the specification doesn't tell you is that, well, that device might continue to operate in the high temperature, but it throttles down the processor significantly. So, yes, it might work in yeah, that, 120 degrees, but, you know, uh, at 5% of the performance you might expect. Um, you know, those are... And yeah, that actually... People have seen... Yeah, that actually uh, happens... Yeah, John, I would extend on that, and in, in that even in the device side of the business, that you know the bench testing that you know really should be done um, in its environment, um, you know that that's something that sometimes gets overlooked because um, you know some devices are actually set up that way where it reaches a certain thermal maximum, it starts to throttle, which then slows speeds and feeds. Um, you know, most of the the you know the 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 the, the good rugged manufacturers. You know, know how to how to dissipate the heat using you know their magnesium alloy ch chassis and designs. And but you know, unless the customer actually somewhat digs into some of the technical data and really puts it in its environment, you know, I would say another one, um, even in hazardous location, we're starting to see that show up even more. You know, class one, div one, hazardous location, um, oil and gas drilling applications, utility applications. Um, you know, gas manufacturing and chemical manufacturing applications. So, you know, class one, class two, uh, class, cla uh, class, class two div one type of, or class one div two type of, of uh, certification. So, you know, as people start to look into the certifications around the device, um, you know, Explorer's always done a very good job at the testing um, and being able to showcase those, those test results. Yeah, I think in a similar manner, uh, kind of back is, as you're talking to vendors and partners uh, that we touched on earlier, is, you know, really digging into the, how much background and history they truly have in mobility. Um, you know, I know sure. I've seen examples where companies will say, well, you know, we've been in this industry, we've been around for 40 years, but yet what they don't mention is, you know, the, mo the mobility solution they're pitching they just introduced in the past year. So, you know, what experience have right. they truly experienced and seen, um, you know, compared to, I know, the experiences that Group Mobile and, and Explore have seen for uh, many years. So, you, Darren, That's you excellent. touched on the, uh, you know, the importance of uh, testing. Um, uh, maybe we could just spend a few minutes talking about that a little bit more. Uh, you know, you might get through all the specifications. You might have mm -hmm. down selected to a couple possible solutions. Um, but uh, I've always kind of liked this uh, Mike Tyson uh, quote of everyone has a plan until they get punched in the mouth. Um, so to me, <laughs> I view testing as a way to make sure you're figuring out these punches uh, before your end customers do. Your thoughts? Agreed. No, I, I absolutely agree. I mean, I, I think that, um, you know, the, the testing criteria, independent third-party testing is, is a viable tool. Um, you know, I cannot, um, I cannot you know, express this enough that, uh, you know, uh, having a solutions architect um, that is involved in that process, um, which, you know, certainly we do on our side, but, you know, having, having somebody that is the, the technical side of looking at, you know, again, the requirements. And, you know, a lot of these customers, as you touched on, yes, they know MilSpec 810G. Uh, yes, they know, you know, certain tolerances of what they would find in standard configurations. But, you know, most of them don't know that, you know, that you have to really ask and request for the test data and, and really do that side-by-side -side comparison. And then, you know, um, you know, balance that out against what the, 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 the nice-to-haves. Um, sometimes people will put in the, uh, the, 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 the nice to haves versus the must haves. And, you know, that's also part of the decision criteria. Um, you know, <clears throat> when people think they need IP67 or IP68 submergible, <clears throat> there's a price tag that comes with that, both in terms of design and, and, uh, and that can certainly be, uh, cost justifiable through the, the, the use case. And, but, uh, again, I think that the, the value cannot be um, uh, overlooked in terms of test uh, information that's provided by the manufacturer. 
Yeah, and I think um, I know. you know, like the IP, the IP ratings is a good one. Uh, you know, back to that worksheet that I mentioned earlier. You know, I found a good way of approaching it is whether you use the worksheet we provide or you make your own, is you give that to all your stakeholders and potential users and ask them, you know, the, the mark whether it's a must-have, nice-to-have, and and just like the IP ratings, um, it, it can be amazing to help surface up misunderstanding. You know, I've seen people that right. oh, we have we have to have IP67. And they just state mm -hmm. it and pound their fist, yet they don't really understand mm -hmm. what the difference is between 67 or yep. 65. Um, well, you know, and I, I've even used this before, John. You know, there, there, there is no, there's not IP police running around our industry. In other words, um, you know, people can use plays on word. It's, it's tested to MILSPAC 810G. Uh, it's tested to, and, you know what people some or it's it's it, 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 there's a difference between tested and certified and end users don't know that um, until you look at the criteria. I've seen devices in the market before, you know that really are nothing more than just a um, a semi a, you know either a semi rugged and or a commercial grade that has been tested to one of the 30 criteria for um, depressurization above 15,000 feet. So therefore they get to use that they're cert that they're tested to or certified to, but that you know, it, it really does take a deep dive into all the elements and then making sure that those elements as a part of the checklist meet the requirement. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that ties right into just, again, the importance of the testing and pilots. Um, uh, mm -hmm. Sometimes the only way you're going to truly see that is by doing a full, you know, pilot and put it in the hands and the environment yep. and the actual use cases uh, that you want this solution to uh, to work in. Uh, you know, as we kind of work towards the end before we open up for questions, uh, I want to come back. We started uh, the conversation talking about budgets. Um, and again, often these projects start with a, a defined budget. Uh, but now as you've gone through this whole process, you've talked to all your stakeholders, you've gotten your executive sponsors, your partners have given you a lot of insight. Uh, I think it's important to kind of come back and reevaluate re the budget, because often now you're going to face a situation that you might have found a solution that meets all your performance criteria, all your specs, but now it ends up costing more than that original budget. Or perhaps you went the other path of you force fit of, hey, well, I found a solution that fits the budget, and you sacrificed on the performance or the specifications. Ideally, you find a solution mm -hmm. that meets both, but I think it is important now to kind of reevaluate that and <clears throat> go back to your executive sponsor and have that business discussion. Um, you know, often these executives, uh, the reason they're in the position they are is because they understand uh, business ROI. And so, you know, they're not really interested in the, the specs and, and the IP police. They're interested in are you going to deliver on the productivity gains or the efficiency gains? And so as you do, you know, go and look back now at what you've learned, what your budget, um, it's really important to focus on the total cost of ownership. Um, and I think this is mm -hmm. something that has really hung up a lot of projects. Um, that you might think in terms of the budget just in the – purchase of the device, but you're not thinking the full cost of deploying the system and how it will operate over the next three, five, seven, or eight years, uh, as you mentioned earlier, Darren. So, right. Darren, how best to kind of take into account the, the total cost of ownership um, when evaluating a project? Well, there's a couple of things that I want to point out. Um, you know, Explorer actually has a TCO uh, model that's available to uh, to its customers and and certainly um, the companies that they work with. Um, the TCO itself is, you know, predominantly based around um, what are the known failure factors of of commercial grade devices, um, you know, versus rugged devices. Um, you know, certainly downtime being one of those. 
for the end user application, um, you know, and how that gets calculated. In every case, it's different. You know, if it's a utility company and their device goes down because it's not the right device, um, and somebody has to drive 100 miles back to to uh, get another PC, um, there's, there's there are all kinds of things that go to the bottom line. Um, but the the TCO that Explorer has um, does produce a, a fairly solid. Um, you know, commercial grade um, and or device, um, you know, non-rugged device against rugged and what that is. Um, you know, the, the um, I can't express um, also the the value of the service packages um, in terms of advanced hot swaps and exchange and lots of the other things that, you know, at least on the group mobile side, we provide our customers um, so that there's no downtime, you know, when there is a failure. Um, it's, it's, not, uh, it's not fail proof, no such thing as a fail proof mobile device, but there's there's uh, a difference between a, a, a half a percent or two percent versus a 50 percent when somebody's trying to put a, an iPad in, in a known rugged application. So, um, you know, it's, it, it's interesting. I, I used this analogy this morning. I don't know if anybody saw the, uh, the NFL game uh, this week, but the, uh, the sideline uh, review now um, is actually on a, on a surface, and which all cool for Microsoft, but they have actually a cover, a shell around the surface so that you actually can see the screen um, when it's outdoors in the daylight. So I'm, I'm trying to figure out the, uh, the ROI on that, um, you know, especially if it's a touchdown for uh, the Green Bay Packers against Atlanta, which they desperately needed. That was supposed to be funny. <clears throat> Yeah. So, uh, but 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 it, but, it, but there are lots of things that go into um, lots of things that go into a TCO, and you know, working with your partner, uh, working with your your um, you know explorer uh, rep to further define the TCO of the known. And these are not guesses. I would point that out as far as TCO. There, and the, these TCOs have been grinded on for 15, 20 years. They're they're known uh, failures. Known. Uh, TCO benefits to rugged versus commercial for these applications. So it, yeah, it is somewhat indisputable, if you will. Yeah, that's absolutely uh, right. And you know, as you mentioned earlier, we we've both seen customers that have done multiple refreshes of rugged devices, and clearly, you know, they've the reason they come back and they don't just jump after the cheap price. Excuse me, the cheap price of consumer devices is that you know they see that actual. TCO and, and the overall ROI of their projects. Uh, let me just touch on a couple other things quickly before we uh, open it up to questions and turn it back to Sarah. Um, obviously, you know, we've covered a lot in terms of the inputs and things to think about as you approach this project. Um, ultimately, you're going to get to a point where you get the green light, you get the okay, um, and you work towards the actual deployment. Uh, you know, I just briefly would mention there's some things to watch out there. Um, there can be a tendency of so much excitement and that you want to just kind of boil the ocean. Um, but, you know, to me, I think I'd recommend how important it is to figure out stages of rolling it out. Um, perhaps a subset of workers, let them figure out and get their input and make them successful, and then they can be advocates to help uh, evangelize the rollout to the, the broader base. Um, you know, back to that Mike Tyson uh, quote earlier, uh, nothing worse than doing a deployment and getting a big punch um, that all of a sudden stops a project uh, dead in its tracks. Uh, Sarah, before I turn it over to you, uh, you know, I wanted to mention, Darren and I, I think both touched on this, um, both Group Mobile and Explore, have a lot of resources that are available uh, to users, the people that are looking at uh, future mobility projects. Um, uh, we'll make those available in, in the follow-up materials. Um, but again, talk, talk, engage your vendors, engage your partners, um, tap into that experience uh, that they have over thousands of customers across many industries. Um, and I think if you do these things and some of the, the tips that uh, Darren and I have discussed, um, we can help ensure that you do have a very successful ROI on your next uh, mobility project. So Sarah, with that, let me turn it back over to you uh, and we can go into Q&A.